Heterogeneous devices, such as GPUs, are present in almost every computing system today. For example, mobile devices contain a multi-core CPU plus an integrated GPU. Laptops usually contain two GPUs, one that is integrated into the main CPU and one that is dedicated, usually for, for gaming. Even data centers are also integrating devices, such as FPGAs. All of these devices help to increase performance and run more efficient workloads. So heterogeneous devices are here and are here to stay. So programmers of current and future computing systems need to handle execution on a wide and diverse set of computing devices. However, many, many of the parallel programming frameworks for these devices are based on C and C++ programming language. And transparent execution from other languages such as Java is almost absent. And that's why we introduced Tornado VM. So in a nutshell, Tornado VM is a high performance computing platform for JVM. So Java developers can benefit from execution on GPUs, FPGAs, multi-core in an automatic manner. In this presentation, I will focus on probability and how developers can use Tornado VM to accelerate their applications. So I hope I picked your curiosity and if you're interested, stay with me. I'm Juan Fumero, a research fellow at the University of Manchester and the lead developer and architect of the Tornado VM project. So today I'm going to talk about um, the following topics. I'm going to introduce some terminology and I'm going to motivate a bit further the project. And then I'm going to dive in into the programmability. So Tornado VM has currently two ways of programming or two APIs. One is called Loop Parallel API and the second is called Parallel Kernel API. So we will explain each of them and I will show you some performance results. Then um, I will explain uh, how Tornado translates from the Java code to the actual parallel hardware, how Tornado maps the application to parallel hardware. And finally, I will show you how Tornado VM is being piloted in industry with some use cases. So let's dive into it. So the question is how to access heterogeneous hardware right now? Um, at the bottom, I show you different hardware, CPUs, GPUs, FPGAs, etc. At the top level, I show you different high-level programming languages. And for this presentation, we will stay with Java, but similar situation applies for other, uh, other programming language, languages. So if we choose Java, Java is executing on top of a virtual machine, and OpenJDK is an implementation of the virtual machine, but also CrawlVM, Coreto, JDK, all of them works in a similar way. So essentially, um, your application is translated from the Java source code to bytecode. And then the VM executes the bytecode. If the application is, run, is executed frequently, the VM can um, optimize the code by um, uh, compiling the methods that run frequently into optimized machine code only for CPU. However, if you want to access heterogeneous devices such as GPUs or FPGAs, you have to do it through a JNI library or JNI call. So essentially the programmer has to import a library and make use of that um, library through a JNI call. In fact, the programmer might, might um, have an optimized application for one particular GPU, but if the application of the GPU changes, it might have to redo it again or might have to retune some parameters. And this happens also with different vendors of FPGAs or different models even of, the, of GPUs. So there is no full JIT that works in the same way that works for CPU, right? In the sense that can get a frequently uh, execute methods or frequently execute code and get optimized code for that architecture. There is not such a thing for heterogeneous devices. And that's where Tornado VM sits. That's the place of Tornado VM. So Tornado VM works in combination with an existing JDK. So Tornado VM is a plugin to JDK that allow us to run applications on heterogeneous hardware. And that's what we propose. So now let's introduce some terminology I need. Um, there are three different architectures here, uh, one CPU and a GPU and an FPGA. And each architecture is optimized for different type of workloads. For example, CPUs are really optimized for low latency applications. 
while GPUs are really optimized for high throughput. While FPGA is a mixture between them, you can get very low latency and very high throughput. The FPGA, um, the, way, the way it works is that it's like physically wiring your application into hardware. So you have in hardware exactly the pieces you need to run the application. That's why you can get very low latency. And you can get high throughput just by replicating units. So now I want to map these architectures to existing parallel, type of parallelism. In the literature, you might find, you can find three main types of parallelism, task parallelization, data parallelization, and pipeline parallelization. So CPUs are quite optimized for task parallelization. So any of these architecture actually can use any, any type of parallelism, but let's say that CPUs are quite optimized for task parallelization, meaning that each core can run different tasks. Uh, in contrast, GPUs are quite optimized for running data parallelization, meaning that the code you're gonna run is the same, the functions you're gonna run is the same, but taking different inputs. So that's why, that's why data parallelization come from. And then you have FPGAs that are quite suitable for representing pipeline parallelization. Uh, in fact, with some instructions, you can enable at the instruction level pipeline of instructions, right? Um, and that's a very good target. So ideally, we want an, a framework that can express different type of parallelism to maximize performance for each type of device. And I will show you how Tornado VM does it. So now I'm going to explain Tornado VM. And in an overview, um, so Tornado VM is a plugin to JDK that allows Java developers to execute programs on heterogeneous hardware fully automatic. It has an optimized JIT compiler and is specialized for different type of hardware. So the code that is generated for GPUs is different from the code generated for the FPGAs or multi-core. Uh, Tornado can run also multi-core systems. Uh, Tornado VM can also perform task migration between architectures, between devices. For example, Tornado VM can run the application on a GPU for a while and later on migrate the execution without restarting the application to another GPU or FPGA or multi-core and back and forth. And Tornado VM, the waste program is fully hardware agnostic. So the input application, the, the source code of the application to be executing on heterogeneous hardware is the same for running on GPUs, CPUs, and FPGAs. So Tornado VM can run with multiple JDK vendors, can run with OpenJDK, GraalVM, Red Hat, Mandrel, Amazon Coreto, and Windows JDK. And it's open source, it's available on GitHub, so if you want, um, you, can, you can explore uh, on GitHub. So now let me explain, uh, let me show you an overview of the system stack of Tornovium. So at the top level, we have an API. And this is because Tornovium, Tornovium exploits parallelism. It doesn't detect parallelization. So we need a way, or Tornado needs a way to identify where the parallel kernels are located in the source code. And that's done through an API. Uh, I have an example of the API um, here in the slide. And uh, don't worry about the details because I will show you step by step how to build an application for Tonovium. But in a sense, what Tonovium provides is tasks. And each task is a method. So Tornado compiles at the method level, same as uh, JDK. Okay, or JVM compiles from the method level to efficient uh, code for GPUs and FPGAs. And to indicate where the parallelism is, apart from the method level, it also provides some annotations. In fact, Tornado provides two, two annotations, at parallel and at reduce. Here I show you an example with at parallel. With Tornado, you can also create a group of methods, which means a group of tasks that are going to be compiled together in one compilation unit. And that's what we call task schedule. And an example of a task schedule is here. So we have a task schedule, we give it a name, and then we have a set of tasks. In this case, just one task, okay? But you can have as many as you want. 
Uh, don't worry about the rest of the details because we will, we will go through an example in a bit. So that's at the API level. And then we have the Tornado VM engine, which takes the input expressions from the bytecode level and generate, automatically generate code for different architectures. Right now, Tornado has two backends, generate code for OpenCL and CUDA. So it has two backends and the user can select which one to use, or sometimes Tornado can just pick one best to choose and run there. So for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to focus on the API level, and we will discuss how uh, Tornado VM can be used to accelerate Java applications. So I'm going to start with an example. I'm going to use the blue filter. The blue filter is a, a, a photograph. It's a filter for photography. So essentially, you have a picture, and you want to make a blue effect in that picture. All the examples I show you in these presentations are available on GitHub, so feel free to uh, check out the code and feel free to follow the code along with the explanation here. So before going to the details of how it's programmed, I want to show you performance of this application running on, on, on a heterogeneous hardware. Here I show you um, three, four different implementations. The first one, the red, is using parallel streams. So it's going to run on CPU, and the implementation is using streams, Java streams. There is no GPU underneath. There is nothing. It's just Java with parallel streams. And the number represents the speed up against Java sequential. So the higher, the better. And I run this on my laptop. I have 16 cores on my laptop, and the speed I get is 11.4. It's quite good. It's not linear, but quite close. If I run this with Tornado on a multi-core, I can get better speed up. Still, I'm using 16 cores, but I get 17x performance compared to Java. This is because Tornado generates OpenCL for CPU, and OpenCL is very good at vectorizing code, so it's using vector units. Maybe those vector units are not easy accessible when you compile from Java streams. Um, that's why you can get a better performance. If we run the application on a integrated graphics, we can get up to 19x performance. And if we run the application on the GPU I have on my laptop, we can get up to 340x performance. It's quite high. Okay. Uh, I, and I run the image, it's, it's an image of 5k pixels by 4k pixels. I think it's pretty standard for any camera nowadays. And if we compare the speed that we get against the parallel version of the Java streams, which is what you can get right now in Java, we can get up to 30 times faster if we run on the GPU. Right, so how is this implemented? The blue filter has the following pattern. So um, as you can see here in the slide, it has two loops to iterate over the x-axis of the picture. So the x yeah, the x-axis of the picture and the y-axis of the picture. So x and y coordinates. And then you apply the filter. So for the specific of the filter, just please go check the code online. It's basically a map operator. So for every pixel, I apply a filter, a function. And this is data parallelization, essentially, because every pixel can be computed independently of any other pixel. So the first thing to do in Tornado is to annotate the code. And as I say, because the pixel can be computed in parallel, what we do is to add annotation at parallel for these two loops. Meaning that we tell Tornado, these two loops can be fully computed in parallel. And we have two levels of parallelization here to the kernel or to the parallel loop. In fact, this is uh, quite um, common on GPUs. So in contrast with CPU architectures, which we have one level of parallelization, we have 10 threads, 16 threads, or 50 threads. On GPUs, we can define 2D level of parallelization, even 3D level of parallelization. And it's because GPUs are mostly created for rendering graphics. And graphics are image of pixels, X pixels and Y pixels. OK, so the first thing to do is to annotate the code. And the second thing, and by annotating the code, we define the data parallelization. And the second thing is to define the tasks. 
So because it's a picture, we can split the task in three channels. The picture is represented with three uh, channels, RGB, red, blue, green. And what we're going to do is to compute in parallel each of the channels, red channel, green channel, a blue channel. For that, we need to create three tasks. So we have a task schedule. It's an object that Tornado provides. Uh, you need to provide a name for the object, um, a name for the task schedule. In this case, we say blur, could be any other name, blur filter. And then you define which data you want to copy in, meaning that I am expecting, Tornado is expecting to play with this data. That's because usually GPUs, CPUs and FPGA, they don't share memory usually. So we need a way to tell Tornado which memory, which regions you want to copy in the device and copy out. So that's done through the stream in and the stream out. And then you have a set of tasks. Task for red filter, task for the green channel and task for the blue channel. And the tasks are defined as follows. So you pass a name, and this is useful because in the terminal, if you want to launch a task, you can say this task run on one device, this task run on another device. You can refer that by the name. And then the second a parameter is a function pointer or method pointer. Essentially, the first is the class dot method. We want to say that the methods inside this class called blue filter. And the rest are the normal parameters for the method call. In fact, remember the signature of the method? was one, two, three, four, five, six parameters, and those are the parameters expressed here, as on any other method call. And then we call execute. So once we call execute, it will run in parallel on the device. So how Tornado VM selects the threads to run? Because the application, the Java application is single thread, we just annotate sequential code with parallel annotations. So what happening is what is happening is the following: when the when it's called execute, so in our case will be filter dot execute. Uh, it will start optimizing the code. It will compile the code from the an, an intermediate representation. Tornado extends Graal, so it's an uh, it's, uh, uh, the optimization happens in the intermediate representation level. It will optimize the code and then it will translate from the optimized code to efficient uh, PTX or OpenCL code. And then it will call execute. When it call execute, it will launch many threads, many, many threads, hundreds or even thousands of threads. So how Tornado knows how many threads to run? Well, it depends on the input application. Remember our kernel, the blue filter, we have two parallel loops and each loop iterates over the dimension of the image. Okay, so X dimension and Y dimension of the image. So Tornado gets this information because, because it compiles a runtime and create a grid of threads. So it's gonna run, it's gonna launch a 2D grid of threads with the number of pixels in the X axis and the number of pixels in the Y axis. And then it will compute the filter uh, separate for each pixel. So each pixel is, it will, be, will be mapped to one thread, let's say. Right, so let me talk about how Tornado enable, enables pipeline parallelization. So we talk about task parallelization, we can define many tasks to run, and, pipe, and data parallelization. So each task is a data parallel problem. But Tornado VM can also enable um, pipeline parallelization. And uh, this is done especially on FPGA. So when we select an FPGA to run, or when Tornado selects the FPGA to run, it will automatically insert information in the generated code to pipeline instructions. And with this, by using this strategy, we can increase performance 2x over the previous parallel code. So it's quite, quite good. So let me explain the pros and cons of using this style of API. Okay, so uh, as an advantage, this API, uh, based on annotations, uh, allows the user to annotate sequential code. So the user has to reason about sequential code, provide a sequential implementation, and then think about where to parallelize in the loop. Uh, in one way, this is fast for development because if I, have the, if I have existing Java code, sequential code, I can just add annotations and get a parallel code. 
This API is very suitable for non-expert users. So you don't need to know GPU compute. You don't need to know the hardware to run there. So it doesn't have, it doesn't require the user to have that knowledge. Okay. Um, as a limitation, this API, the loop annotation API, we call it parallel loop API, is limited in the number of patterns to run. So we run, we can run the typical map application, which is the filter. So for each pixel, you compute a function. That's the map pattern. But all the patterns like scan or complex extensive is, is, is hard to get from this API. Also, this API doesn't allow the developer to have control over the hardware. It's totally agnostic. And some developers need that control. Also, if you have an existing OpenCL and CUDA code and you want to port it to Java, it might be hard. So for, to solve these limitations, we introduce a second API that we call the Parallel Kernel API. And I will explain to you how the API is. Um, uh, how the API looks like. So let's go back to our previous example, the blue filter. We have, remember, two parallel loops that will iterate over the X dimension and Y dimension of the image and compute the filter. We can translate this to our second API. So instead of having two loops, we will have ex implicit parallelism, parallelism by introducing a context. So the context is a tornado object that the user can use and that object will give you access to the thread identifier for each dimension. So for the x-axis, we can get the information through context.getGlobalIDX. And for the y-axis, we can get information from the context.globalIDY. And then we compute the filter as usual. So this is closer, if you are familiar with CUDA and OpenCL, with those programming models. In fact, you might think about, as I say, 2D grid and then to identify in a unique way each thread, you just need to access to that thread in particular through X position and Y position. And then you compute your thread as um, you do your computation as usual. Um, so how do, we, how do we know the threads to run in this case? We need something else, okay? So before, remember that Tornado will uh, analyze the expressions at runtime and we'll get the threads at runtime. It, and that's fully transparent for the user. In this case, the threads are not set. So the user needs to set up that for, for us. And in this particular example, because it's a 2D grid, the user can create a 2D grid called worker2D and passes the, the X threads to run in the X dimension and Y threads to run in the Y dimension. And then it will set up the name of the function with that worker grid. And then when we, the user calls the execute, it will need to pass the grid. That's the only difference they need to know. Uh, I haven't mentioned, but through that this API, the kernel parallel API, the user, apart from manipulating at the thread level, can access local memory. For example, GPUs has different uh, memories, uh, global memory, local memory, private memory. So the user can program that memory or can even synchronize a block of threads. It's very, um, very close to what you might find with CUDA and OpenCL. So, well, if we have this API that is coming from CUDA and OpenCL, why do we want to use Java instead of having the application in OpenCL and PTX or CUDA uh, and PTX? Well, Tornado VM has also other strengths for example, lifetime migration, as I mentioned at the very beginning, or code optimization. So we specialize the code depending on architecture. Also, if you run on the FGA, the workflow to run on the FGA is fully transparent, it's fully integrated with Tornado, meaning that you can use your favorite IDE, for example, IntelliJ, Eclipse, or any other editor, and you just can run on the FGA if you have it. And it can also be deployed easily on Amazon instances, for example, on cloud deployment. So you will get that for free by porting that code into Java and Tornelium. So I'm going to show you some performance results because, okay, Tornado can be used for more than just applying for filters for photography, right? In fact, it can be used for other type of applications. For example, for FinTech, mass simulations like the Monte Carlo or Black Scholes that we see here 
It can be used for computer vision applications, for physics simulation, for signal processing, and so on. Here I show you a graph. The x-axis shows different types of applications and different implementations for running on the multi-core. Well, the implementation is the same. It's different uh, executions for different devices. The blue represents the multi-core, the green represents the FPGA, and the violet the purple one represents the execution on GPU. And the bars represent speedups against Java sequencers, so the higher the better. As we can see, for some applications, running on the FPGA is, doesn't, is not worth it. So you don't get any speed up. But for all the type of applications, like physics simulation or signal processing, is very good at it. And you can achieve very high speed ups. For example, for signal processing or physics simulation, you can get a thousand of speed ups compared to Java. Okay? Uh, these results are taken from one publication that we have. So if you are interested, just check out our website and um, it's, in, it's listed there. So, I show you a few examples, but how Tornado VM is being piloted in industry. I show you here two different use cases that we are working on. One with Neurocon company uh, in Luxembourg. They run natural language processing algorithm. And so far, what they have achieved is um, 30x performance by running the hierarchical clustering algorithm on GPUs. Uh, we have another use case, in this case from Sparworks company. Uh, a company in Ireland, based in Ireland. And what they do is they have information from IoT devices that they, 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 they want to post-process that, inf that information. So they use a very powerful GPU, GP100, to do the, the post-processing, and they can, they can get up to 450x performance compared to Java, which is quite good. So I'm going to, just to finalize some remarks, um, Open, uh, uh, Tornado VM is open source, so it's available on GitHub. You can download it, you can contribute if you want to. Uh, you can make suggestions. We are open to uh, suggestions from the community. In fact, some of the uh, features I have been talking today are coming from the community. Uh, we also have Docker images, so you can run Docker, you can Tornado with Docker. It's uh, very easy, assuming you have the driver already installed, it's just pull and run, essentially. And there is a team underneath, there is a team behind Tornado VM. So uh, this is not created by just one person. Uh, we are, this is an academic project. We are in academia. Um, and we are interested in collaborations, either academics collaborations, academic collaborations, or industry collaborations. So if you think this is useful to you, and you think that can be helpful for your workflow, we are happy to talk. So just reach us and we're happy to, to have a discussion. So to summarize um, today, this, these are the main points I would like you to remember, right? So I have shown you that heterogeneous devices are now pretty much in almost every computing system, okay? And there is no escape. Um, programmers of current computing systems as well as future computing systems need to handle somehow with the complexity of having a wide and diverse set of uh, devices, such as GPUs, FPGAs, or any other car hardware that is coming. Um, along with that, I have shown you a strategy, a proposal to program those devices through Tornado VM. So Tornado VM can be seen as a platform, JVM, high performance computing platform for Java and JVM that works in combination with the existing JDK, for example, with OpenJDK. Um, we have discussed an application, for example, the blue filter. And I have shown you two different ways of implementing a blue filter. One using the parallel loop API that is well suited for non-experts on parallel computing. And the parallel kernel API that is suitable for people or developers that know CUDA and OpenSeal already and want to pour existing, existing code into Tornado. I hope I convince you that Tornado can get really high speed ups. And with that, I conclude my presentation. So I really, really thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take questions. So thank you very much. Hello. Hello. Hey, thank you so much.
I think one of the things that we should start with was that debugging question that you said yeah. that you will, uh, you know, kind of clarify and add more details. Yes. So let's do that. Yeah. 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 So debugging is very tricky. I think the question was that because if anyone in the audience have so has um, experimenting, have been experimenting with GPU, compute, and FPGA, debugging is very frustrating. So fr it's very frustrating task. So what Tonal VM can do right now is um, login information can give you the compilation time, meaning uh, Tonal can comp compile from Java bytecode to the actual uh, OpenCL or PTX, right? So we time those uh, times, meaning from Java bytecode using Rack compiler to the PTX, and then a second step of compilation is from the PTX or OpenCL via the driver to actual binary. And I can give you that as well as data transfer time. For example, how much time uh, does it take to uh, send data back and forth? And how much time does it, your actual compute kernel takes, along with how many threads Tornado run on the actual platform, besides what, what to do with your application, right? So all this information can be enabled with a profiler option in Tornado. And it's not fully debugged, so you cannot step by step, you do a step by step execution on the GPU, um, as far as I know. Um, but I don't know that there is any project on that. I think it's complicated because you have usually thousands of threads running on, the, on, this, on that platform. Um, what you would usually do is to have a small set of threads to run on there and then debug the application from that point. So that's one step. The second step is that we can speed the code that Tornado generates, meaning that I want to see what Tornado generates for the OpenCL code, and then I can debug it myself. And this is useful, especially useful on FPGAs, um, because the FPGA war is, is another area. And related to that, with the debugging, uh, we have also a debug mode for the FPGA. The FPGA also added a lot, a lot of extra overhead in the creation of application, debugging, and running, right? So um, I didn't cover in this talk. I covered it in the previous KeyCon talk last year, but usually compilation on FPGA takes hours, two or three hours of compiling a code. This is because if we generate OpenCL, that's what OpenCL driver gives us, right? Uh, but Tornado can run with the debug option and it's fully integrated with the low-level tools. For example, if we are using, if we are using uh, the Intel FPGA with the Intel tools, you can run your debug mode from your IntelliJ, for example, editor, or whatever editor you use. Just run debug, and you simulate that application on FPGA, right? It's not running actually on FPGA. It's running on your host. But it's a quick try that your application, what Tornado generates, can actually run on the FPGA. That's one thing of the debug, yeah. That's I hope cool. I, I hope I answered the question. I think it was a bit longer, yeah. No, that was awesome, and you gave the step by step as well. Uh, recently, I was looking at an OpenCL stack, uh, and and I and there were some differences that I found out based on the operating system and the enablement that happens right from <clears throat> from the underlying ar uh, hardware architecture to uh, up to the OS. So, have you found uh, you know your code to be or or uh, Tornado VM to generate <clears throat> a different <clears throat> optimized stack. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Uh -huh. And a different optimized stack depending on the OS and the underlying hardware architecture. Yes, yes. In fact, it depends in the, in the driver we use on the same system, same operating, exactly. same operating system, right? Yeah. So I can tell you an example. We have a few months back. So uh, what, okay, what Tonel does inside is a bit complicated. Um, is it's not only about the, the full JIT, it's also managing data, buffers for you and so on. But essentially the code that is generated per architecture is different, right? One of the things we do for uh, reductions, when you have a reduction, it's a special case when you run in parallel. So uh, just a quick recap, a reduction means that you have, uh, let's say a list of values and you want to reduce all of them to a scalar value. This is fully data dependent. So to run the next iteration, you need to compute the previous one. This is an algorithm to make this in parallel. But to do this in parallel, you need to insert, uh, you need to play with, and in the GPU world is called work groups, meaning mm -hmm. I split my problem in smaller problems. And because those uh, threads, those block of threads that is, uh, is a subset of the whole iteration space can share memory, but sharing memory on GPUs is not coherent. You need to insert barriers. 
So we had this a few months back that uh, we had these redactions working, uh, but then when one platform, Intel actually, it didn't work. Uh, it was because one of the drivers, they put something that Tornado didn't realize. Then the next version we have to, we have to, go, we, we have to put an issue on GitHub, they, they fix it, then Tornado can pick up and magically redactions continue working again. So yes, even the same platform uh, with the same OS, it's just different driver implementation. Uh, you can get different behaviors. Usually not, usually you get the same thing, okay? Uh, actually, we cross-validated between them. So we have a full um, uh, unit test suite and we run it in different architectures. We're on Intel integrated graphics, Intel CPU, NVIDIA GPUs, and uh, we run a subset on FPGAs as well. And we cross-validated that everything is going, is going well. That's pretty cool. I mean, I'm, uh, it's it's very smart to to build it on top of like Open G, OpenCL and uh, CUDA and everything. So I think uh, that's very sad. And I like the idea of cross validation and unit testing as well. There was another question. I think you mentioned that you would like to cover that. I think it was the AOT and Fulgit. Do yes. you think you have some time to do that? Yes. We have about so, three minutes. Uh, all right. So on FPGAs, uh, yeah, they want to so, support so both. You can have the IoT. So you can run your Java code and then speed the OpenCL code, then compile the code ahead of time. Even you can make your own modifications even. So if you're an expert in OpenCL or CUDA, you can just throw your new modifications, new optimizations, and then pre-compile it and run it with VN. And that's fully integrated. So for the VN, it says, okay, I just saved completion time, but that's all. On the FPGA, it's more complicated because this long term, uh, so, uh, especially we designed this ahead of time because of the FPGA workflow. So the way we usually go for the FPGA is that we first do the bugging mode. So we try on CPU on your local host, and then uh, we do the full JIT mode. We say, okay, you type, you know, you have your application, you run it, and then you wait two hours to get your binary. I mean, if you're running on a server, big, you know, uh, that runs on the application for months or years, waiting two hours is, it's fine. I mean, as soon as the application is ready, Tornado will switch the device. But for many users, they want instant performance. So for that, you can plug in your FPGA, your bitstream, uh, which is the configuration file for actual uh, architecture for the FPGA. And we can get that binary from directly from, from the OS, from the yes. That's very nice. Um, I just wanted to send out a reminder that we have a Zoom room with the speaker, and I'll pop in there very briefly. And, Please bring your questions to the Zoom room, get to uh, talking to the speaker directly. Um, uh, and if you have any thoughts uh, to share, please do that as well. I thank you for your time, Juan. Uh, this was awesome. I, I learned a lot again. <laughs> so I'm so glad that you um, actually joined us here at QCon. And, Thanks. Thanks for um, having me. It's a pleasure. <laughs> and we'll see you in the Zoom room. Thank you all. Thank you Bye.